Hello and welcome to the 91st episode of Fur, Fins, and Feathers. The show is taking off. It's now shown all over the nation and in many parts of Europe and South America, and we're doing quite well thanks to the generosity of many people who have participated in this show. Today our guest is Robin Nickerson of Swansea, who is a well-known ornithologist and educator yes. and artist, and you do it all. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you again. Robin, tell us, how did you get interested in birds? I think I got interested in birds with my mom as a young girl. My mom always fed the birds and... Did you have feeders outside the house? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I still use feeders today and she taught me basic backyard birding, um, bird species. It's not really much focus on the calls. So I would like to share a little bit about what I know about birds and a little bit about how I found out. Okay. Okay. So um, initially, as I said, I studied birds informally with my mom in Swansea, Massachusetts, feeding um, ground feeder birds as well as feeder birds. So a lot of times there are certain birds, mainly by size, that um, eat at the feeder and they may shake the feeder a little, some fall down, and um, they also, other species eat from the ground. They do that primarily because of their size. So blue jays are a ground feeder bird. Even cardinals, even though they are also a feeder bird if really desperate. So what I mean by desperate is if it's not season for fruits and nuts to be easy access for birds, then they're much more attracted to your feeders. It's really important when you are uh, feeding birds that you take into consideration the Audubon and Cornell University studies that say you do not fill the feeder every day, but rather fill it three or four times a week. That way, heaven forbid, if something happens to me, birds will be able to forage for themselves. However, I do think it's important when talking about birds, maybe to back it all the way up to the time of dinosaurs and paleontologists. So initially, birds, the first bird, which I think if you're thinking about what I'm saying, you probably are picturing a pterodactyl. So the relationship between pterodactyls and backyard birds is extremely close. Ornithologists, those who study birds, um, call the tuft that is on the back of the pterodactyl's head and the cardinal and the blue jay and the tufted titmouse um, a throwback. So this is part of the evidence in the anatomy of a bird that makes ornithologists make this connection. What I think is really interesting is the vision that you or I or any of us may have about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are just the imagination along with the study of the structure of dinosaurs, matching this to animals that live today, like an alligator or a crocodile or a lizard, and they kind of restructured the bones, I think, pretty accurately. The concerning part of the, the um, paleontologist study is that they now realize probably the covering, the skin, and what you actually see in an illustration to be slightly different. Paleontologists today believe that most of the dinosaurs had feathers, so that really links dinosaurs and birds, but we know that birds were around since the ta that time, and that um, I think is very interesting. I think another interesting point is that birds were able to last when dinosaurs could not, so from um, global catastrophes like the Ice Age and um, the light being blocked out of the earth and plant life no longer being able to support the dinosaurs who had were so tremendous in size, the birds still could make it through this to this day. Studies out of Cornell can attest to how smart birds actually are. So a lot of people looked at birds and thought small head, small brain, 
but that is definitely That's not the case. That is not the case. So they have trained through experimentation um, crows to follow so many steps to get the food and in the final event of this study at Cornell, as I said, which is the biggest name in bird studies, um, a crow can learn up to 20 steps and they can actually even, because this was so great in Jane Goodall's um, presentation of chimpanzees and primates, they can not only use a um, an instrument to help them feed, but then they can modify, I think this is wonderful, modify a, a tool that they're using to help them feed to even become a more effective tool. So one of the studies is a pipe, and they have put food on either end of the pipe, and two crows are in this room, and they're learning to get their seed from the pipe. A few days later, they have now pushed each day the seed further and further into the pipe until the crows can no longer stick their head in and get their body in to eat. They then gave them a piece of wire. Initially, they could get some food out with the wire, but they, it wasn't efficient, and they definitely processed that so that they actually bent the wire. Is that wonderful? They bent the wire so that they could drag it out more effectively and therefore survive. So, so they're a lot smarter than what people think. That's right, they, they really are. Um, from there, I think that the story of birds in general goes to John James Audubon, who summered here in, Mass in Massachusetts, in Westport, Massachusetts, sorry. And um, I think some great things happened with him. So first, let me just start with his initial observations of birds and his illustrations that he is so famous for. So initially, I think pilgrims, as well as Audubon, kind of thought that we would have an endless supply of birds and animals. And um, the birds were shot and then drawn, and quickly and named. So most of the species that we have in this area are named by John James Audubon quickly looking at the work, people started to realize that bird's neck isn't actually depicted accurately. And this was scientific observation and illustration. And they wanted to make it more natural. So the first attempt at making it more natural was to add leaves to the illustrations and, or, or, or branch. But then they realized, I can't make this bird look because, of course, they're studying, so they're really looking intently at the bird and every single part of it. I can't make this bird look real unless the bird is alive. And a big, this is a wonderful thing, a big um, push came to record observations from life. And they had already cameras. All they had to do was like write down this color, that color, quickly in notes as they observed because birders can sit for a very long time to observe in a hide, that's something they temporarily build, take a shot with a camera, work from the illustration from the camera, and their notes. And that became much more accurate. So if you're looking to collect work from Audubon, and you, they say you can find them at a yard sale, I'm not 100% sure of that. I have tried by looking in old calendars. The original works, craning necks, birds, that don't look perfectly anatomically correct. Those illustrations are worth the most. The next ones are the ones that are adding um, a branch, a leaf, and then the final illustrations are the illustrations that include the background and the setting where the bird actually would live. Another really great thing about Audubon's work is that um, he then became involved with the ladies of temperance movement. And at that time, um, I would say as early or as late as the, um, if going back in time to 1930s, women would wear, it was highly in fashion, especially by those who could afford these fancy hats. They would wear a hat that had bird feathers on them and it was nothing to go out and hunt that to sell these very fancy um, feathers, N not just the feathers actually though, because 
wait till you hear this. They may actually even wear a whole nest on the hat. It was in fashion to love nature, to flaunt your feathers, to flaunt your hat, and to go to a tea in the city of Boston. Well, they realized when Audubon was no longer hurting the birds, maybe they should no longer. Temperance movement women put a lot of money into passing a law and changing the fact that um, they should not harm birds for any reason, so I'm really happy that they did that. Um, after that part of the story, I think another thing that really helped birds in general was the use of DDT. So I'll give you a little background on DDT. How's that? Oh, yes, I'm interested. Okay, so um, everybody knows one of the most common endangered species is the... Osprey. The osprey. And it's the, a similar story, but I'm going to go with our heritage. I'm going with the bald eagle. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, so the bald eagle, as well as the osprey, were profoundly affected by the use of DDT. This was extremely difficult for ontologists to figure out because they saw nothing wrong with either one of them. And they saw that they were still returning to their home in the spring. They saw that they were leaving in the fall. They so. Observing all these things was difficult to see them. What is it that was wrong? What is it that was wrong? So these species in a broader umbrella called raptors um, live primarily on fish. Although osprey can, you can definitely see an osprey with a snake as much as I love birds. A snake in its talons, you can see uh, the same thing with an eagle or even a mouse. They will eat what they have to to survive and they will bring that to their their fledglings and their their nestlings but at the same time the the problem was is that surrounding any so fish are in a body of water surrounding any body of water is something called the watershed a slope of land down to the water with that slope of land and the use of DDTs at farms in this area, as well as houses, it was just a common product used during that time, the rain will wash it down the slope into the water. Once it's in the water, the fish are now eating plants that could be affected by this, breathing through water that has DDT in it, and it really, I really don't know studies about the fish, but I do know that ospreys ate that fish, and that fish caused a problem with their eggs. So many large waterfowl, like the lovely great blue heron and the um, lesser and great egret, these birds could not lay eggs. They'd make their nest, they'd come back, they'd sit on the eggs, and the eggs would crack. This was saved by taking eggs from ospreys in Westport out of the 75 platforms on the east side of the Westport River and brought up to the Chesapeake Bay area where the water was not affected because the land around the Chesapeake Bay was not being used for farming. Those chicks were able to survive, go on, and the DDT use stopped in the 50s. When that stopped, you can notice yourself right now, there are many more birds that you may not have seen as a youngster. There are loads of ospreys in Westport. There certainly are. And they're beautiful. They are. Many people often think they're seeing a, um, a bald eagle when they see an osprey. So that being said, that was another thing to um, raise the population. It is also the main factor that the bald eagle is no longer endangered. It isn't that people brought them food or did anything special. We stopped using poison that was affecting their there. Talk about your work in Westport, in the watershed. Okay, so I was a river docent for about 10 years for the Westport watershed. We started at the east head of the, um, the, the river, so if you're going over the Hossneck Bridge, just before Hossneck, if you look down towards the back eddy, which is a restaurant to your right, you will see a marina. That's Tripp's Marina, and we left out of that area. They trained me in ospreys and also wildlife. So then, then my birding skills became my major focus is large waterfowl. Fowl. So although what I, species would those include? 
Um, well, I mentioned some, so the lesser egret, the great egret, the swan, the Canadian geese, the um, great blue heron, which is my favorite of all, uh, if, but I do love all birds, but, <laughs> but um, as well as the osprey, perhaps if you're fortunate, the bald eagle, um, you could see a um, green egret, um, but for the most part, the, those are most of the birds. I think it's very interesting that I went walking the other day, being that the great blue heron is known as one of the shyest speech species. They are about, I would say, three feet tall. So standing on this area, they're at least this tall. They also have that pterodactyl throwback, and the average adult great blue heron has a wingspan of about three and a half feet, so they are just something really special. They kind of fold their neck back in an S position as they take flight, and their legs stick straight out. But as um, soon as you see one on a beach, they usually head right out of there. I was walking in a lovely area that would be a great place for a birder to start birding on the Quickashan River Trail through the city of Fall River, and I saw two at one time, double tree, pure excitement in my heart, looked to the left, and they were so used to so many people being on that trail, they didn't even leave, which was so surprising to me because a lot of times these recessed areas I was talking about surrounding a body of water is flanked by a freeway, sadly or a road, and um, when they take off, if they take off really low, that's a danger to birds, but it's not something I think that would really decrease their numbers. I know a lot of people are afraid of what's happening in um, Nantucket Sound with the windmills and out in the ocean. I do think it can be a threat, but I don't think it's a threat as detrimental to the success and while of these birds as um, the, D, the use of DDT. Could you please talk about your, <clears throat> excuse me, your activities in Westport and the, some of the conservation areas where people should be able to go and walk, and they do, and bring families, and it's a great place to get out in the great outdoors. It is. I would suggest that you do um, use some DEET on yourself and then take yourself to Allen Pond. If you go straight past Westport on 88, when you get to the end, um, you're going to take a left and then go all the way past Cherry and Webb Beach. Did I get that name right? Yes, you yeah. did. Okay, so you're going to take a left at the end and just about a quarter mile you have Allen's Pond. There are some wonderful um, Audubon presentations and birding. T you can find out about these on the Audubon website. Two weekends ago was Raptor Weekend, and they definitely had special events there. Were there were some great areas for birding in Adamsville mm -hmm. and all throughout Westport. Yes, but I think that it's nice when you go um, to also go with a guide. So you'll stop. And there are many guides in the area that are very willing to uh, share their knowledge. Absolutely. Another really great place to go, fabulous, it really is, is Monomoy Island off the coast of Chatham. So if you are what willing... What a fabulous place. It is. And if it's... Uh, let me just describe it to you first. Monomoy is a geomorphological island which basically means that after each winter and the storms, the shape of the island actually changes. It is a stopover that um, the Red Knot can be seen at. There was a great um, series, not a series, just a one-time uh, presentation and show from Nash from the, oh goodness gracious, now I'm, I'm losing myself, I'm sorry. Um, they also make the book, the standout book that we use at the school. Yeah, I... <laughs> <laughs> National Geographic, I've got it. Yes. I'm so sorry. No, um, you're fine. <laughs> okay, so the National Geographic did a special on the red knot. Now let me describe the red knot and the species that may go there. 
So the migration part of birds usually starts at the beginning of July, and it usually ends the first week in September. If you hear that there is a shark sighting in this area, then it's probably at Monomoy. And it's at Monomoy because the seals are migrating there. And the seals are migrating there because they're following the horseshoe crabs that are laying their eggs. So the horseshoe crabs and the turtles lay their eggs on the full moon. The seals follow the horseshoe crabs and turtles so that they can have something to eat. And so do the birds, as well as the sharks. So it is the full food chain happening. I will just say, I went on a tour there with the Lloyd Center. So they do run tours every year. And um, just keep your eye on the Standard Times, the Fall River Herald News, and on the Sunday section of What Can You Do? And the Lloyd Center is a place that should not be missed either. That's right, in Dartmouth. It's, that's also a birding migration route, as well as the Swansea Town Beach is part of that route. However, I, and I will say that you definitely can see all of those large species that we just talked about, including the oyster catcher. Um, this year I only had one sighting of an oyster catcher, but I was very happy that I did. And I had that on Cuddy Hunk, where I also... And that's another <laughs> topic that I wanted to discuss. Tell us about Cuddy Hunk. Fabulous place, reasonable, and um, I think any family would have a great time there just packing up a lunch. You can go to the ferry in New Bedford, but you are not going to go on that, those ferries. When you pull into that parking lot, you're going to veer to the right where it says Cuddyhunk Ferry. It is a smaller boat, but you'll be going a little bit more of a distance. Cuddyhunk is an island off the coast of Nantucket. That very few people know about. It's true. Um, and they reached out to me this year because they heard that I was an ornithologist and a previous art teacher. So on Cuddy Hunk, I taught young people from the Falmouth schools, New Bedford schools, or Fairhaven schools how to record their observations. And I'll just show you Please. a few of mine. So this is a sketchbook that I've used that I record um, notes and illustrations just from nonfiction genre that I read. And um, with, a, with a, a focus on birds, here's one on owls. So I read this, I've observed this. I've actually run an owl calling class at night with an owl craft and um, a hot chocolate. And you've done things at the Swansea Library. I have, I've done nature walks behind the library. There's a lovely piece of land and um, I'm very knowledgeable, just saying I really am, about the plant life there. So here's another one, penguins. Let me just take, to, take you red-eyed tree frog, um, crocodiles and alligators. You might like that. Another penguin book and the illustration of... You know, um, I think, and you're sharing this with people, but many people don't realize the beauty of our area. It's really a special place. And it is a very special place. I have a hope to own a house in, in West Palm, uh, the part of Florida that I'm used to. I hope that they're all okay with their hurricane hitting them today. today? Yes, but I will say that I will always come back to New England because the birds are the best here. So with that being said, I would like, if you are thinking of being a birder, to go to those places. I really think most of the groups divide up. There's a recorder. I usually like to take that and photographs if I can. I do have binoculars with a camera attached. I did not bring those today. But here is an illustration that I have of just backyard birds. This is teaching young people how to think as an ornithologist, how to think as a scientist, how to watch the bird, use their senses, which is the sense of hearing, the sense of seeing, the sense of, um, and re the sense of perhaps um, mostly sound and seeing, and make some notes. So some notes I have just on a male and female cardinal. There's that tuft that 
is related to the pterodactyl. Clicking sounds, chipping sounds, the minute you hear that sound, if you get used to it, um, you know, there's a cardinal in my yard, so I'm going to run out there and see that. Are you going? Yes, that's the next thing I'm looking <laughs> These for. These are books that you can nice use. Nice books. Are you going to have some sounds? I am. I also have a sound making little device here that if you're in the woods and you're kind of hiding a little, um, you can use this, and I'll do that in a second. Um, this way, you can study the sounds here. I really learned them from a CD, but I brought this because I thought it would be better. Um, and record your observations of another backyard bird, a great blue heron. These are quick sketches. Um, and the and all of these materials are available at a public library. Absolutely, yes. Um, I have like three CD sets in my car right now. Teaching One is a teaching one. When I take it out, I just write the number down so I can go back to it without backing up. Also, um, recording Marsh Life, which is a really great place for observations of nature in general. And um, this is a BHP, which I don't know if everybody knows. You know, Robin, another thing about these things is that they don't require people to make a big financial investment. They don't, but they're so readily available in your backyard. that Exactly. It, I do think one of the best things, if I dare say this, that came out of the pandemic is that more people became birders. So remember what I said. Studies show out of, I have to say this, out of Cornell and Audubon that you should not feed every day. They will become too, in, too dependent on you. So feeding and rotate your days. My days are Wednesday, Saturday, Monday. And that way birds can, can absolutely um, be forages as well as feed at the feeder. So this is world birds and I'm not going to use that one right now, but this one is songbirds from North America. So this would probably be um, a good friend of mine, Diane actually um, told me about this book. So just to quickly go, um, here's a type of gull. So a lot of people think that gulls are all the same. They're not. There's many species of gulls in this area. The most common is the herring gull. You also have the ring beak gull. So the herring gull is the gray wings with the um, white head. And the ring beak gull has a little ring right around the beak. A lot of people have fed gulls at the beach, correct? So that little red mark is something that they share with penguins. That's a regurgitation mark. So when they have babies, they can go back to the nest. Baby pecks on that red spot. Regurgitation is how they feed their babies, just like they're... We're being told it's almost time to wrap up, and I would love to hear the sound. So I do want you... Oh, Northern... Um, so... Hold on, there we go. So if you take it to page 20. And the nice thing about this is that each different, let's see if I can get a completely different call. Um, is that, that's the kill deer. And Fascinating. So this is a really good, ooh, <laughs> this is a really good way, but I don't want you to miss out on this. These are a moderately priced book. I think I bought mine on, oh dear. <laughs> That's all right. Let's hear what this one has to say. So you can get this on Amazon as well. And it's a wooden piece of almost a bead. You just turn it and birds will come to this. That sounds like a cardinal already. So if you'd like to try that. <laughs> Go ahead. And that's a simple thing that will call birds. Very Nothing good. will call birds like food. Very good. How's that? It was wonderful. I really, we've got to have you come back for could, round two. We'd love to have you come back. You've been very enjoyable as usual. So we sweet. had a good time. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thanks, Brian.